I'll kick it off. So for today, you know, I wanted to focus a little bit on just, you know, finalizing the Connectathon preparations. You've probably seen me posting a little bit on Zulip. I think it's coming along. If anyone has any comments on the agenda, I think that the those scheduled sessions work, I think, for most people. So I'd love to just lock that down. Obviously, the Connectathon is coming up very soon. And my major ask is to volunteer yourself for some of these sessions. Um, so I'm happy to do a short overview. Hopefully you've seen my deck. So look in that Zulip channel, the Zulip chat for, I just threw up a really simple, simple deck. If anybody can't access it or edit it, let me know, but you know, open source, right? You can just start writing content. I think mainly it's just figuring out who is going to be presenting when, and I'm happy to MC all the sessions, but you know, I don't want it to be me talking. So I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but now's a great time. There's an agenda slide where you can add your name, various parts. So specifically looking for somebody, I don't see if we have enough Ryan or Brian on the call today to talk through the spec. So the intro session. So firstly, starting for the intro session, I can do a short overview presentation, and then I'd love to have somebody talk to the spec and then somebody do a demo and, you know, I don't, we don't have a lot of agenda for that, that, uh, that one, but I think a demo would be good. Plus, of course, we want people to advertise those to, you know, your social media network, et cetera, to get people in, interested in it. For the implementation show and tell, thank you to a couple of folks who've said they would give presentations. I think I'd love to have a bit more. Nikolai. Yeah. Yeah. Tell some more yeah. ideas. They will do presentation yeah. and I probably can do presentation of JavaScript reference library plus test mm -hmm. environment. Yeah. Okay. I can yeah, walk that's... through the implementation. Let's call it like how to kick off your implementation, like naive, quite useful. So, and I can walk through the tests and through the infrastructure because, yeah, I think I, I can finish it till connected. Okay. I think that's what I was looking for. I wanted somebody to go through the reference implementation specifically, and I was you know, confident that you'd want to do what you're working on with Postgres. I think Bashir, you were interested potentially in doing something with, with what you're working on with Google. That would be fantastic. So, you know, put your name down for that. So I feel pretty good with that. Am I missing any of the major implementations that we might be interested in seeing a show and tell on? This can be you say someone yeah, is doing Postgres? Uh, Nikolai. Huh? Yeah, yeah. So it's implemented yeah. in eight box on top of Postgres. It's not open source. Yeah. I'm not sure that me will present this, but we do tell Samurai. Some of engineers will definitely present what we have now. Okay, great. So I think, you know, the reference inflation, Postgres, John volunteered, Aaron volunteered the work on Databricks. If it's a SQL on fire-esque implementation, I think that's useful as well to see what you know patterns have been developed in the industry. So I think we're probably pretty good on that one. Nikolai, for you to do agenda for the testing hackathon portion, and then Craig for fire and OMA. You know, I know that there's been some interest, but can you give us any update on that? Yeah. Well, so I don't actually have a SQL on fire implementation for it. I have a my own bespoke implementation for Fire to OMOP, which is similar to SQL on Fire, but I started on it before this sort of matured. I don't know. I know Nikolai was looking at it as well. Like I, I can't really address specifically the challenges for SQL on Fire to OMOP. I can talk through what I've done or even demo it, but I don't know if that's useful to folks. Uh, I think it, it more could be more discussion with the some yeah. demos than like final result. Because yeah, we we tried to join a couple of meetings, a mob guys. They just ignore us. What problem we have? Yeah, hope eventually that yeah will happen. But okay, so we we can just talk more deeply about what, what what should be done. Yeah, this terminology mappings. Who should do this and what capabilities should be in engine, which will do translation. And yeah, I think yeah. people and I both have sort of tried to nudge them on the terminology side a little bit. Maybe need to be more. I need to be more explicit about what I think they should do. But yeah, if any of them join, we could talk through all of those things. I guess sort of housekeeping is, is this going to be through the actual connected or through a zoom meeting like we have here i'm not sure i'm i haven't signed up for the connectathon yet so i don't know if i'll have yeah. uh, access to the uh whatever that app is they use that i think we can share just link to zuli on a fish as far as yeah as far as i i mean that's what we propose to sandy and hl7 she uh i just sent her an email today uh because dan just noted that he was not seeing it on hoover but she said no, this is fine. The way you're approaching this, you know, works for us, you know, submit. And, you know, we had to fill out a form a couple of weeks ago, but we haven't seen any response from that. So we don't know if it's going to be listed on the Whova app. 
specifically at this point. Hopefully Sandy will get back to Dan and I shortly on that. But that's the assumption that it's like not official Connectathon track, but it's like on the Connectathon app so that people can see it. Not the bug somebody to fund my Connectathon ticket then. Probably not too hard. Yeah, well, I just signed up today. It wasn't too bad, I guess, because I think I have an HL7 membership now. So yeah, what I'm looking for for that one, that's the Thursday, 3 p.m., is, is really, I think, just a list of questions or an agenda. You know, I think Nikolai, you, Graham, some of the other folks who are interested in OMOP, maybe John, I can't remember. Like, you know, we can even fire up a... Yeah, well, let's try to get let's people... A, yeah, we can do that. I'd love to have this. And I'm going to reach out to some of the folks uh, internally at NCQA. And they've already suggested... I know, Craig, you're talking with... I can't remember her name. Uh, there's a woman who sort of is leading that charge. So I think we can yeah. get a couple of OMOP folks interested. But I what I would like to see is just five discussion points so that we have some structure to it. That's That's really what I'm looking for. So... If you could take the lead on that, Craig, and just, you know, either throw up a Zool topic and just collect, you know, I would say five discussion points. And so we can frame that discussion a little bit. That's that's what I'm looking for there. And then similarly for the roadmap visioning session, actually, how about I, I'll spin up a Zulip thread on that and just say, like, I know we've had a couple of ideas. People are interested in a couple of different directions. The roadmap might go in. Let's just put them down in one place and then we'll throw it up into the into the deck. That's all I'm looking for there. Anything else on the Connectathon? That's all I have. Yeah, I think for Connectathon, I can show what, what uh, like I turn the work from head to the legs back. So, and do like test driven development of reference implementation. And I think this will push me to write good tests. Because if you write this for yourself, then you write it in the right way. If you do it for others, it doesn't work. And uh, another idea I, I can maybe share the screen show what i have can you see yeah. it, it's not yet committed but I, I, okay so the the time to collect feedback so i want to make kind of clean reference implementation which should from my point of view look like uh, the algorithm which was described by ryan so the general idea that people can go and read this javascript code probably we can put the say the comments which ryan uh, shared it on this uh, processing model and we can even complement processing model with a JavaScript code because when you go through this there's a lot of questions how it should work and so the general idea that yeah to make it highly readable like give it the names and all this stuff so and uh, so I'm just refactoring the initial implementation to make it more readable and here is gonna be the tests yeah, like this. So the columns uh, for each and select behavior. So let's say we have a for each, select, and column. And this combination, so let's put it together, for example. So, uh, should these view definitions be the same or not? So we can move column from uh, this section inside select. Should they behave the same way or, uh, I don't know, We if we have select, uh, it should be mutually exclusive with a column. And a bunch of questions like this. So, and I'm going to cover all these uh, cases with the tests and hope that the implementation uh, will be readable. So I even thinking about like literate programming. So write this implementation in literate style and we can generate uh, the page like Ryan written, but with a real implementation behind. So, so to be clear in this, uh, I, mean, I think Josh put together most of this content. So credit ah, words. Okay, so sorry. sorry. Okay, yeah, Josh, Josh implementation. Yeah. And I, and he also made a comment in the chat that, that the, it, it, it should generally align with the existing reference implementation. So yeah, I think there may be some alignment there or, uh, but yeah, I don't want to speak. I think Josh is on the call. So maybe I uh, let him. So. Yeah, just, just, I mean, at least for historical purposes, the, the place that that page came from is I wrote that by reading the current reference implementation. So they shouldn't disagree with each other. So just if you're going to refactor the reference implementation that you might want to take the new structure and rewrite the processing page based on how that turns out. Yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to make the structure of the implementation uh, the same like the description of the algorithm, yes? And highlight. Them. Yeah, but I think, it, I mean, I guess my point is that today yeah, it, it should it's be almost like- I wrote the page by reading the algorithm. So yeah, if they're yeah. out of sync, something went wrong. Yeah, yeah, okay. 
Well, I think maybe we we can table this. I mean, I think the you know short story here is that you know Nikolai is refactoring the reference implementation to stay in sync with the. Well, let's say of, to, of the I'm rewriting to understand it because <laughs> at the first try it, it's quite hard to read it. Yeah. So, but the, my proposal that uh, during Connectaton I can walk through the reference implementation and the test cases and through some key points and uh, and help people uh, who will. Uh, who is going to implement it in memory using Firepass engines, like giving the guidelines how it can be done and walk through the test. I mean, I think that's a great start. Sorry, Arjun. I was just going to say, just going back to your example, where you had the two different queries that were yeah. maybe the same. Isn't the difference that the second one is sort of scoped by contact and, and you, you start traversing from contact in those sub-selects, whereas in the first one, you have ID and then you have the things that are under contact. I think they, they both scope it by contact. But if I skip the select section, yes, it will behave like just for each with the columns, yes, which is scoped by contact. But if but I do... In the, in the, the second two? one, yeah. person comes off contact, right? So if you put ID there, that wouldn't be the ID of the... Yeah, I think the way to make it the same would be to use like percentage resource dot id or something like that. Okay, but but at least th that highlights that 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 we have like stuff to clarify. Yes, and I think through these tests, uh, yeah, so we we can work. And the, another idea that I, I'm gonna make it like a real tests, so run it with implementation and then generate. Uh, the reference test from that. There, there's a lot of questions. A... That's not the only question, which, yeah, about behavior. Yeah, did you have a question? Uh, well, I have a, uh, I guess, maybe a tangent question. Do we actually uh, have a list of, like, implementations, like open source implementations that we maintain either under the IG or the GitHub? There should be registry of implementation. Uh, Is there? I don't think... think any that are up to date. Yeah, it, it's not up to date. Uh, the pull request. I even forget where, where it's located. Okay. Okay. So there should be one then. Okay. There should be some JSON tests implementation. Yeah, it's a test report public implementation JSON where you can where you can submit your implementation with link, and the mm -hmm. build will produce a page which will list all these implementations with the test. I'm sorry, where is where is this file under? Is this implementation this okay. report public implementation JSON? We probably should put it in, in the root of the uh, repo. Yeah, I found. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I mean that's one one place, but I think well, it might expand because yeah. uh, you know there might be more implementations that we don't necessarily know about. That is the one location that we have right now for listing the implementations. But so what I I noted, I changed the title of the uh, Wednesday meeting for you know, testing hackathon, but also, you know, clarifying the spec. We can get into some of these questions about interpreting the spec as well. I don't think it's just focused on, you know, like we normally do in a hackathon is just, just test writing. So I think it might be a little bit different, but Nikolai, in your sense, the way, you know, walking through the reference implementation, looking at the test cases that you're developing, talking about, you know, interpretations, that seems like yeah, that, that would be nice to express it as a test cases, like so, and discuss this stuff as a test cases. So if uh, if Josh and John, you, uh, yeah, I, I will push this stuff uh, in a separate folder. So if you can contribute, to, like how tests should behave in this situation. So let, let's try to like talking with through the tests. Yeah, my one request on this one, Nikolai, is if if you are making changes to the reference implementation that change the behavior, will you just flag those changes? Like I, I, I have my head wrapped around the current behavior and it's fine if you rewrite it. I just want to make sure I know what's different afterwards. Yeah. I, I don't touch the current reference implementation. So I started from scratch uh, in different folder. But eventually we'll swap yours in, which, yeah, which eventually is- Eventually we will swap. Yeah, well, when we get to the point, it, it will reach the same uh, stuff. Because I'm trying to simulate the situation when I'm implementing from scratch, yes? And, yeah. and the test should help me, not, not like yeah. make the mess, but help me to implement it in, in the right way, yes? Awesome, that sounds great. Like, clarify all these situations, yeah. Okay, great. I think, you know, there's a couple of odds and ends for the Connectathon, but I think we're generally on track. Go take a look at the HL7 site and register if you haven't yet. Any questions on the Connectathon? Okay. Yes, oh. actually I do. So yeah. like when I'm still a little bit confused about how we will 
access it and you're talking about sharing it via socials and all that sort of thing so like what how will people actually call into this thing and when will we get the details for how they will call into it? Yeah, Dan, the way I understand it is that we will have sessions listed on the official Connectathon app called you know, Whova. You were there at the, you know, the Whova app. And I guess they uh, assign Zoom links in Whova, Dan, generally? Yeah, I think they'll give us... Uh, the way it's worked in the past is that they give the presenters like a uh, a Zoom link, and then everyone else connects in through through the Whova app. I don't personally love the Whova app, and we can set up our own Zoom. The advantage is, if we want to like bring in a broader community, having it in Whova and in the Connect Connectathon world means that people who are interested in the topic uh, will join. So I think particularly for the overview and demo sessions, it makes sense to use Whova, even though it's a little bit of a pain. I think we could talk about whether we want to use Hoover or just jump back to our own you know, for, for other things. But the, the main, the, the summary is that there's no real benefit to us. It's just being listed in all the HL7 stuff will, you know, kind of expose the project to a broader community. Yeah. So is registration actually a requirement for attending this session? So if I was to put out and say, hey, come along to this, am I saying you need to go and register for HL7 or, or am I just saying you need to call into this Zoom link? I think HL7's answer would be that you have to register for HL7. Maybe you should Yeah, I guess that. this is probably more a question for HL7. I also agree with John. I prefer that way, but I guess somebody in HL7 wouldn't be happy if you do that. Okay, great. All right. I know we had uh, at least one outstanding question from Bashir. I don't know if we wanted to talk through that a little bit, or at least get that on the table for a couple of minutes. We did want to talk about SQL generation as well. So how about Bashir, at least you remind everyone on the call what the issue was, you know, where we're at currently, what you were thinking, and then, you know, maybe we time box it to five, 10 minutes. Let's say something like that. How's that sound? Sure. Yeah. I, I try to be quick, but uh, yeah, I mean, there was, uh, so the, the context is the type, you know, whether we specify types for view definitions or in view definition or not, or basically, and the issue comes up when you want to actually export to a system that requires like a database table, for example, right? So that's the context. So when I was reading and, you know, there was, there was a, there was a thread, not probably not too long, but, a, you know, a, a fair discussion about it back in September, which I was not paying too much attention. And that I commented at the end of that because it was very relevant. And then the argument there was that, you know, by default, do we expect that the implementations have type inference or do we expect that the view definitions should specify types? And, you know, supporting type inference is a great feature, especially when you are authoring these view definitions. I totally agree. But the current wording is, to me, it seems, and we can get into the details of it, but it seems to me that, you know, the expectation is that the implementation should support type inference. But my proposal is that the expectation of the implementation should be that if, you know, if, the, if it wants to export to a type uh, system, the view definition should provide the type. And the exception is that, you know, some implementations can be smarter and they can do type inference on their own. And the reason I'm suggesting is, is that, you know, doing the type inference is considerably, uh, you know, higher because you need to get involved with the structure definitions and, you know, doing doing those kind of work. And I, I guess the benefit, I'm not sure if the benefit of having a little bit uh, simpler view definition resources, the extra effort that is needed for all implementations to to support that. What I'm thinking about is when we want to share view definitions. I, I, I think uh, we want to get to a place that the view definitions become like a standard resources that people can share between different implementations. And for that shareable resource uh, or anything that becomes like a standard uh, view definition, I like the types to be a specified. Thing. So first of all, just to clarify, because you mentioned structure definitions, are, are you talking about like, yeah, why do you need structure definitions? Because my understanding of the inference is that it's more at a fire path level and then potentially augmented with implementation specific tags. So if you have a fire path implementation already, you should pretty much have the inference that you need is standing. And then you can add on to that with implementation specific sort of 
type hints. I'm not sure that you need to get into the fire type. I think it's more of the fire path type level is, is my understanding, but others can sort of confirm that. Yeah, so the difference is, so let's say, you know, in my implementations, I'm relying on Happy, for example, like, you know, for Happy's uh, biopath implementation. So basically the, the implementation is that, you know, you give a resource like you know, an actual resource, like a patient resource, and then you apply the fire path on, and then it gives you like a list of base resources, basically, right? That's basically what it. When you want, let's say you want to do the, you want to create like a database table for for from your view definition. So there is no fire resource actually involved. There is no patient, no observation, nothing. You just have the view definition, and then you want to create the corresponding database table. Then you need to be able to understand that fire path, uh, which again, you know, it's, it can be implemented. It's, it's currently not supported in, in HAPI's implementation, but you need to be able to parse the fire path and then understand that, you know, yeah, in the context of a patient, this fire path will give me like a string or give me like an integer at the end. So that's the kind of the difference. And can you use the HAPI implementation to sort of introspect the fire path expression to see what type it should be? Yeah, so currently, like internally, if you look at the internal implementation, it does like, you know, some, you know, it parses the fire path and then a step by step in go, it goes through, but it's very much baked into it. The, so that like the, there is actually like assumption of the presence of a resource and you know, recursively, that resource is basically being passed to you know the subpaths, basically. So that's how it works. Again, you know, this this I mean, we like in a Bunsen, you know, I mean, we have Bunsen and we have a structure definition kind of uh, support, but I I think we shouldn't get into that for just for this feature. So currently, our implementation is completely independent of Bunsen. It only relies on Firepath like Happy's fire path implementation. I think we discussed this topic. Yes, this is, uh, so in September, there is a fairly uh, long discussion and that was, I think, the outcome, the current wording, and I'm actually proposing to change this. Yeah, but I get cases using Happy's implementation as well, where if you get an empty type, like you don't know the type or decimal, sometimes it would return an integer. So you have those three cases, it could be empty, which you don't know what it is, decimal or integer. So there's, there is some variability where it could be helpful to be explicit on the types for sure. Yeah. And, and part of the discussion there in that thread, just you know, to give a summary for everyone, because I know this is from a few months ago. So I think Ryan and Josh were, I think you were arguing that we, we, we have a certain, like a subset of fire path that is allowed in, in view definition. So it's much easier. Like, I mean, I guess uh, Graham's argument was that, like, like Craig is saying, is that it's actually a very difficult problem to do a generic type inference for Firepath. And then the counter argument was that because we only allow a, like a subset of Firepath in view definition, it is a much simpler problem, which, which I agree with. But my point is that, you know, still, I feel the, the default behavior, or I guess the default expectation on view definition uh, like a shareable view definition should be to include types and an advanced feature of the implementation could be smart and have typing, type inference. That comes into the picture mostly when people are authoring these view definitions, which is important, but it's not, you know, all the cases. In many cases, you just want to, you know, understand the view definition and, and run. Yeah, I think that, that we discussed it on the call and that was, uh, the conclusion was exactly like you told. So, and uh, another think, question was what, what, what kind of types? Because we have like ANSI database types, something like this, and we have fire types, and it, it is different type systems. Yes. What do yeah, you yeah. Think and, in, in, like database right. types or fire types? Yeah, and this was actually the second part of uh, the, 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 the topic that I wanted to discuss. What was that? Because currently the suggestion in this spec is to have tag to specify the ANSI type. And my suggestion is that this should be completely left out of the spec. There should be no mention of it. It should be left to the implementations to decide that, you know, okay, I am interested in Postgres and, or, or you know, I'm doing Parquet or whatever. Then I have to use this, this type. I think that's, but I mean, let's, let's leave that for now, like, you know, the, the actual ANSI type. And let's assume that, you know, we are talking about the fire type because I guess now this is the current wording. My suggestion is, or, or if this was the conclusion from that discussion, that's now how, it, it's, that's not how it is worded in the spec right now. The way that it's more like, uh, yeah, it should be, sorry, 
Yeah, so so let, let's make sure we're talking about one thing at a time, first of all. So yeah, so this will focus on the fire types rather than the database types. We can have that conversation as well. But let's, we should make that trade-off is ultimately a judgment call. Just like, yeah, where do we have placed those priorities? And, and, you know, we saw that lengthy discussion back, you know, a few months ago in, in order to do that. And and so like, I'm, I'm you know, looking at the, the, the draft again now, it's like the, the intention there is was, was to like, Hey, for the common case, make things easy for, for the authors. And then, uh, and then, uh, you know, and, and, and uh, so, you know, you don't have, you say, you know, uh, you know, patient.active or something like that. I don't have to add the, you know, Boolean type explicitly every time I, you know, put in patient.active. And, and I think that that's nice, you know, whether, uh, yeah. So I, I think this is totally a judgment call of whether we want to make it uh, required or whether we want to, I mean, we could even consider, I mean, like in an, an alternate thread, there's been like a few discussions of like having like some sort of like tagging of the, the view definition itself. So whether it's like sort of compliant or, or like, you know, for fully finished or whether it's more in like a draft mode. And so maybe we could have like a, a, a you know, de fully defined annotation uh, or a fully defined uh, uh, a status code that we put like on the view definition itself. And so if something's fully defined, maybe it requires then I'm just thinking out loud. I don't know. It's like, I don't think that reading the structure definition for these constrained use cases is terrible because we did constrain it quite a lot uh, to when we, when types are inferred. So like, uh, so basically, if, I mean, basically it comes down to is like if we would infer the types like one, either like it's a simple path off of a root resource, in which case it's just looking up the key from structure definition and it's, it's there. And the other one is like, basically if there's an of type expression, you know, we, we need, you need to kind of match that of type and get the type from that. So there's a regex there. The intention is, is that we shouldn't need to really, you, you don't need like a full parser of the fire path expression. I mean, it can be basically just match whether it's a simple expression or whether it's like an of type. And if it's not those things, then these types are required. And so that was kind of like the the, the judgment trade-off that we kind of landed on after a pretty lengthy discussion in September. But you know, it's it's again, it's 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 just it, there's there's definitely this is a, a it's not like really an, a necessary right answer here. It's just kind of more of where do we want to make that trade-off, and that's kind of where we landed when we discussed earlier. I have a question. Do we think because we, we've got actually like three different sets of types here, right? So we've got the fire type, which comes from the, the fire data model. And then we've got the fire path model, which the fire path spec actually, well, the fire spec maps the fire data model types onto the fire path types. So when you traverse into an element, you, you get something that has a fire path type, but can option, but will also have a fire type. But then you will also have other expressions which only have a fire path type and no fire type, right? So, so the fire path types are, are a smaller set of types that are just, you know, Boolean string, integer, decimal, date, date, time. That, and so I guess what I'm asking is, do, do implementations have to know how to map all the different fire types into pot potentially really fine grain types on their side? Or is it good enough to be able to know how to represent each of the fire path types at that slightly more coarse grained level? So I guess, do you need the fire type to persist it into the, in all cases, in all implementations that we can imagine is, is my question, I think. Um, sorry, just sorry, sorry for jumping in just to better understand your, your question. So assuming that, you know, we are separating, like Ryan suggested, separating the question of what is the actual database type, separating that and just focusing on the fire type. So I'm not sure if I understand your question, because I think at the end of the day, you apply the fire path on a specific fire resource, and then you will get a fire type, which, you know, the question here is, you know, the, the discussion here is whether it should be specified or it should be inferred. You see what I mean? Well, I mean, an example is, you know, like I could have, I could have an element that's of a markdown type in fire path and in the database, I don't know, maybe it's a text. Do we need the information that it's markdown type in fire or do we just say all string things in fire path go into a varchar? I mean, that, maybe that's a bit of a numpty example, but it's... I mean, so I'm going to take a good. pause here. Yeah, just in case, uh, because we are having a good conversation here, but I, I think this is probably a broader conversation. And I, I, I did think we wanted to potentially talk a little bit about SQL generation, but I'll take it from the group if you want to continue this. 
or because we only have a couple of minutes left. So 15, 20 minutes. So just wanted to take a break here to see if we want to keep going down this road or switch over. I think this is an important question. So let's let's discuss it. Yeah, and we won't have a lot of time to even get started on SQL generation, right? So we can table that. Okay, great. Let's continue. And Bash, can you uh, tell again your motivation? So why you think that, that uh, it should always be annotated with the fire types? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, actually, you should. Maybe I should clarify a little bit. Uh, so I, I am actually not proposing that you know it should always be there because in many contexts you don't even need the type, right? What I am saying is that for uh, so if I want to put just in a one sentence uh, like the problem statement for a standard view definition which we expect to be shareable, the type should be specified. That's my proposal. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, if I am, like, I mean, the implementation could be completely flexible and not requiring like type if you are exporting to CSV, for example, right? But you, by, by should you mean like fire should like recommend view definition? Yeah, that's basically what I'm saying. It's kind of like- So the implementation, so basically whether you are putting- the share Shareable true, then all types should be specified. Yeah, yeah. And then like during, uh, like, I mean, an, an, a more advanced implementation, mm -hmm. which is good for authoring, could actually, you know, uh, infer the types on the fly, which is great. But it's not that, you know, every implementation should have that advanced feature yeah. such that, you know, it's acceptable. But, yeah, but what's the reason to annotate everything with the fire types? Yeah, the reason is that, you know, I think the, the amount of extra work to support type inference is is significant yeah. and because i think i mean i'm still curious I, about the final result of like a, a application of u definition it could be csv uh i don't stream of some protobuf so that the... yeah if the output if if the output is typed like i mean parquet protobuf mm -hmm. avro database table whatever right then that becomes an issue if it's something like csv yeah it doesn't matter. Okay, so the logic is so so if people want to implement like type at output, uh, it would be nice to provide type information. Yeah, so yeah. Don't force them yeah. do the inference. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I think the inference work actually. I mean, yeah, I mean, Ryan is is right that you know, yeah, I mean, it's a subset of why. But I still I feel that you know the a little bit simpler, but still it requires like you know you need to understand the structure definition you should be able to go down the, the tree of a, sp a structure definition and then handle all the cases like you know it's a choice type it's a complex type a composite type or whatever right so all of that logic is is required which is you know thankfully for us we, we can actually do something with that mm -hmm. i think i i know firsthand this is actually a significant amount of work mm -hmm. i mean i have currently an implementation which i, I have done from scratch without relying on one or anything and it works without you know, if, if you specify the types, but if I want to add like type inference to it, it would be significantly more uh, complexity bringing to the into the library. Yeah, so I think my my main two points are you can't actually say here's an expression, here's a fire type, because not all expressions have a fire type or a fire type makes sense for it, actually. Because if you have like a, a comparison operator or something, that's technically not a fire type. So that's that's the first point. And then the second point is if you can parse fire path, you should be able to know what type it is at a fire path level, including the happy implementation. And it's I can't really imagine a scenario where you can parse a fire path and not know the fire path type of that expression. So I guess what I'm trying to f figure out is what the balance between that information and what you need is and and why isn't that in the present in the implementation that you're using. Mm -hmm. And I think your idea about fire path types and fire types and difference between them is well worth to discuss because do we really want to understand like markdown code or we just need like a string, fire path string? I think, you know, like, like, it's obviously much simpler if you just look at fire path types. And I think that's one of the reasons we also came up with those database type hints is because in some instances, you might want to sort of optimize that and say, okay, well, this would be stored as a varchar, but in this case, we want to hint it to store it as 
something different because it makes more sense in this particular case. That's what I thought the point of that sort of mechanism was. There's still still some situation where the coercion may be needed. If you have number uh, like ins and float, then you want to coerce to something. Yeah, so just to mention like a hypothetical example to, to John. So let's say I have a Firepath implementation that works with actual JSON resources. And then what I, what I will do is that, you know, I tokenize it basically and step by step. So if I have a JSON resource, actually like a patient resource, step by step, I say, okay, it has like a, the address, then I pass the address and then I apply the rest of my Firepath to this address. Right. So it is completely, but it's a very generic one. It doesn't, it doesn't need at all to understand what is the structure of a patient resource at all. But once you bring the question of, okay, this is the fire path and I'm going to apply it on a patient. Tell me what the type would be. And you definitely need to understand, okay, a patient resource is going to be like that, you know, codable concept at this step, I would get a code and you know, therefore it would be like a stream. So that's, that's the difference basically. Yeah. Then. Yeah. On that last point, I, I guess I'm not following exactly. Like I think, don't you, I mean, you always have to have kind of the data from the structure definition to walk a fire path. Cause you have to know the cardinality of each segment. And so if you have that, you also have the types. And so you should, I guess that's the part I'm not, I'm not clear on. Like, it, it feels like this is information the implementation already needs to uh, to kind of handle the fire path. I disagree with you. I wrote okay. a couple of implementations. So it is possible to do like dynamic implementation, which don't care about types at all. Well, sorry, to put a better point on it, you either need to know the structure definition, in which case you can trace the types, or it's dynamic, in which case you can inspect the types or not worry about them. It's okay. not, I don't understand the use case. No, there is a difference. So if it is, let's say it's dynamic. I mean, my case is not dynamic, but let's say it's, it's dynamic, right? So you can't, so dynamic in the sense that, you know, you will get like a JSON resource and then dynamically you apply fire path on it, right? But then the question of type, let's say if you want to create like a database table for it, you have no resources at that time. So you need to answer this question of when I apply this fire path to a future patient resource, what is the type that I'm going to get? So that's where it becomes, you know, you have to parse the structure definition and understand. Dynamic fire path evaluation, but statically typed database storage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But again, you know, I'm making it like a hypothetical because this is, I'm trying to replicate the current situation with the happy library. But I mean, uh, in happy, obviously it can be expanded include that use case that I'm saying, but currently it is not. But I, I think that the, so we have a ability to kind of annotate with a type. Yes. So the question, should it be required or not? Yes. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, and what, what, what type of information should it be fire pass? or fire? I don't know. Yeah, that's there is, piece, there are some understand. use cases in which people are using the actual, I mean, I know, I know Graham had like, so maybe let's just a, a couple of other discussions that we can dovetail with this with and perhaps like solve a couple problems with the common solution. So I know, I know Graham had interested in like some, like having some of these expressions still return like struct types or that sort of thing for more complex use cases. And so that adds a lot to it. And so maybe there's like the, there's two worlds where we have like some sort of like either like draft mode of a view definition and a finalized mode of the view definition and the finalized mode, maybe we do have like a full type information because you could take like a, I mean, you could have a tool that takes the structure definition draft mode, applies these rules and adds the final types to the output to it. And that, and that becomes like the final type version if it simplifies static analysis of the output. I, I, I don't know, I, I'm, I, I'm not convinced either way in that case. And, and then similarly with what the final output should look like, I mean, maybe the final output does is constrained to fire path types. So, and, and, and so that further constraints it there, but like the draft mode can be like anything in fire. And so we have a sort of a nice definition there and fire path types are nicely constrained. It's, there's some things though, like, I mean, so it's fire path types, I think fire path types like lose the distinction between date and date time. And so that's, and it seems like an important distinction. So yeah, I don't know, maybe we need to consider that too. Yeah, that's a good point about the date and date time that we would it would matter at the database level. I guess my, my feeling in general would be to put more on the, more of the complexity into the, the folks who are like very deep into this and less on like an IG author to understand like that they got the types right by like counting through their, their own fire path. And, and, and there could be tooling that they could run to kind of add that. But I guess 
we're putting things on the, the people who are, you know, kind of on the, the much larger user set to, to simplify things for like a, a much smaller set of developers. So I guess I'm, I'm open. I see some of the arguments for it, but I guess my if it's possible, my preference would be to like do whatever we can in an automated way so that the authors don't have to worry about it. Or we can like leave this question for the future. Yes. When people start using, they will come and say, guys, we need type information. It doesn't work that way. Yes. And at, at least I, we agree that we should not do it by default, like, like. Uh, require type information by default, yes, in every view definition. So yeah, yeah we've actually. I was just going to say we've talked about this sort of shareable profile, but we haven't actually manifested it. So currently, we don't have two levels, but in the future we may. You know, so at the moment we've got the the view definition, but we don't have this additional sort of profile on top of it, which is this shareable pattern that we sometimes use in Fire, and we add additional constraints and all the rest of it. So maybe this is an issue to look at when we come back to adding on this shareable profile on the top of the base view definition. Yep, because I I can imagine. Oh, sorry. When when we come to the query resource, we will need like ANSI. Annotation, type annotation as well, because if people will treat view definition as a table, we will want to share some type of SQLs as a part of uh, IGs. So then we have to annotate with the types as well. And ANSI is the closest like common denominator for this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So just two, two clarifications. One, like, I mean, currently with complex types, if it's non-primitive in the current spec, we require actual type. So that's more like a question for primitives. So it's only, you know, type inference is only supposed to be supported for, for primitive types. The second point, I mean, I also very much agree with the concept that we may have like draft view definitions, and then we may have authoring tools that actually have type inference. And then, you know, there is like export command that would you say, okay, now I'm happy with this new definition, now export it. And because that tool support type inference, probably it's much, it's very easy to just annotate types as well. Because we are out of time, I was just wanted to make sure that, so for the next steps, do we want to continue on Zulip on the same track? Do we want to leave it for future discussion in here? Or what, what should we do? Yeah, let, 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 let's do this on Zulip because it will keep the history and more people can join this discussion. Yeah. Perfect. So I'll just follow up with my message on the same thread, which is from a few months ago, because it has all the history, and then we can continue. Yeah. Sorry, guys, for taking too much time. Yeah, yeah. That's a good you. discussion. No, I, yeah, I think that's that's perfect. Let's follow up in Zulip and just, you know, I was following along, but probably my notes are not that great on this one. So if you could, Bashir, you know, do some bullet points in the terms, you know, in the sec- in the different points under discussion, essentially, to, to try and clarify them a little bit, I would be helpful. I'll try and clean up and add to that as well. So yeah, good conversation, certainly. Yeah, excited to see this moving forward. And uh, yeah, looking forward to the Cactathon next week. So my last request, go take a look at the slide deck, add any comments on my intro section, and then add your name. I think I have the most folks who have volunteered so far. So I'll, uh, I'll be in touch on that. Thank you. All right. Thanks everybody. Bye.